Hello and welcome to the latest video on UCSGuru.com. My name is Colin Lynch and in this video I'm going to walk you through connecting up your Cisco UCS environment to a Cisco ACI fabric. Uh, so as ever in these videos we'll walk through all the configuration leaving no stone unturned. Um, I'm sure you're all aware we live in absolutely awesome time for change of, of uh, networks at the moment um, as we move to a more software defined model. Um, it sounds scary but is it all that complex? Well, just like most things, the more you learn about something, the less scary it becomes. So that's the aim of this video, to show you, perhaps for the first time, how to connect your Cisco UCS to a Cisco ACI fabric. So this is what we're going to cover in this video. Um, we're going to co configure the UCS um, side. We're going to create our VLANs, create our uplink port channels into the ACI fabric. Uh, and then we'll jump on the APIC, the Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, and we're going to create our VLANs on the uh, Fabric side, uh, our Interface Policies, our VPC on the APIC side, and our vSwitch Policies, um, our APIC Interface Policy Groups, our Tenants, our Bridge Domains, we're going to create our subnets, and our endpoints and contracts. Don't worry if all that's uh, new to you at the moment. When we step through it, well, we'll talk about each bit in detail. This is the physical topology we'll be using during this video. So as you can see, we have our um, Cisco ACI fabric, our spine and leaf network, uh, connected to a pair of Cisco fabric interconnects uh, via uh, virtual port channels, and obviously our APIC controller. And this is our logical topology. So you can see there we have our VMware environments within our Cisco UCS infrastructure. Uh, we have a uh, VIC card, the virtual interface card within the Cisco UCS blade in orange there, and then our uh, two virtual NICs in green, and then they're connected to the VMware distributed switch. Um, the Probably the most important thing to note here is how the APIC and discovers changes within the virtual network environment, and that is by end-to-end -end LLDP. The quirk here is um, is that the VIC card within the B-series blade will not forward through LLDP packets that it receives northbound. It will terminate them, but it won't pass them through to the VMware environment. So the solution there is is to turn on CDP within the Cisco UCS environment and within the VMware environment. And then the APIC is intelligent enough to stitch the southbound CDP and the northbound LLDP together to make a end-to-end -end, uh, layer two discovery protocol. But as mentioned, don't worry if you're not sure how to configure that on the UCS side or the ACI side, we'll step through the configuration here. Okay, so this is the configuration we're going to put on the Cisco UCS side. We're going to um, enable CDP, create our pool of VLANs for the tenant, uh, create the port channel between the fabric interconnects and the ACI leaf switches, and then map those tenant VLANs to those uplinks. Okay, so let's crack on with the UCS configuration. Okay, so let's just log in. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need to check is that CDP is enabled on our VNIX. So I've already got a service profile here. Um, it's, I'll use 11. Okay, now this service profile has already got uh, four VNIX created. Uh, ETH 0 and 1 are for management, with ETH 2 and 3 will be used to uplink to the ACI fabric. So we'll just expand that out, and we'll just confirm that our network control policy ACI enable is associated to VNIX. So, yep, ACI CDP enable. So 
Yeah. And then it's also on uh, two and three. So ETH2 is going to Fabric A, ETH3 to Fabric B. Okay. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a VLAN range that we're going to assign to this uh, particular ACI tenant. Um, obviously, if you're not using a you know, a multi-tenant infrastructure, uh, you don't necessarily have to create a VLAN group. Um, similarly, if you was uplinking to um, a non-ACI environment and an ACI environment simultaneously, perhaps for the purposes of migration, um, you would then just use sort of standard um, disjoint layer 2 uh, rules, i.e. have a group of VLANs going to the classical Ethernet non-ACI environment and then a particular group of VLANs going up to the ACI environment. So I'll just create a range of uh, VLANs 2160 to 2169 for this particular tenant and there they are So, so the next thing I'm going to need to do is just create a VLAN group and pop all those VLANs into it. Okay. So you see, again, always good to give them a nice logical name. Okay, so now I'm going to actually create some port channels. So I'm going to create a port channel from Fabric Interconnect A up to our pair of leafs that will be running uh, as a VPC pair. So currently there's uh, no uplinks into the ACI environment. So we use 11 and 12 from both Fabric Interconnects. Just confirm that they're there. Okay, so I'll just give it port ID of one and two ACI. Do the same for fabric B. And same two ports on the other interconnect. Okay. So those will currently be down because they're not going to be seeing any LACP from the leaf switches from the ACI yet. Yep, so no operational members and I guess very shortly, yep, there it goes, so failed. And I'm sure the other one will be not be too far behind. But well, we're not going to worry about that just now. Okay. So now we just need to ensure that that VLAN group that we created earlier is mapped to these port channels. Okay, so again, a little bit of a VPN lag. 
Okay, so back into our Uplinks Manager. And we want to make sure we put those uh, VLAN group into our port channel. Oh, why isn't it there? Oh, because I've selected Ethernet links, not Uplinks. Okay, yeah, so I might actually want port channels. There we go. That's better. Okay, so yeah, the VLAN group I want um, associated to both port channels. Okay. And as far as the UCS configuration is concerned, that is pretty much all we need to do. Uh, we'll check back on this fella a little bit later once we've done the ACI elements of the configuration. Um, but essentially we have our port channels. Um, just waiting for the, the VPC configuration at the Nexus end. Okay. All right, so they popped back up just, I'm sure while I've changed those VLAN groups, but I'm sure they'll be straight back down again. Right, so I go. All done with the UCS configuration. Okay, so now we'll get on to the uh, first configuration of the uh, Cisco APIC, the Application Policy Infrastructure Controller. So the first thing we'll do when we get on the APIC is to create the tenant pool. That will, uh, in effect, mirror the pool we created on the uh, UCS uh, side, the same VLAN IDs. Uh, then we'll create an attachable access entity profile. Ooh, new word. Okay, so the AEP um, represents a external entity, uh, an external entity to the ACI fabric. Now this could be a um, a bare metal blade, a hypervisor like VMware, Hyper-V, uh, KVM could be an external layer 2 switch like the Fabric Interconnects, it could be a external layer 3 router, basically anything that's external to the fabric. Um, it can also represent a, a group of external entities. Uh, the key bit being that those external entities should have the same uh, connectivity requirements, whether it's a, uh, a VPC, an LACP port channel, um, you're running CDP or LLDP, they should have a similar uh, connectivity requirement. It's worth mentioning that obviously within the UCS environment, um, we will be running a distributed virtual switch within VMware. Now the distributed virtual switch will have a different connectivity requirement than the Fabric Interconnects. For example, the Fabric Interconnects will be using an LACP port channel northbound to the leaf switches. However, as the Fabric Interconnects are not VPC aware themselves, they cannot provide a LACP port channel southbound to the distributed switch within VMware. Um, so similar, to if you've ever set up a, a distributed virtual switch, um, or the Nexus 1000V, for example, within VMware, within a UCS environment, you just need to um, create a MAC pinning uh, port channel. So it doesn't you know, think they're an LACP uh, pair, in effect. Um, hope that's clear. Um, then the last thing we'll do in this uh, little section is create the various interface policies um, for those connectivity requirements. So we'll be turning on CDP where we want it, turning it off where we don't, uh, the same with LLDP and the same with LACP. So for example, we want LACP between the Fabric Interconnect and the leaf switches, but we do not want it um, southbound um, from the Fabric Interconnect to the um, distributed virtual switch. So let's fire up our APIC GUI and boy, do you never get tired of seeing a HTML5 interface after all the years of pain with Java. Okay, so let's just log in. 
Okay, so this may be the first time you've seen the APIC interface. It is, uh, I think, available on the Cisco D Cloud if you wanted to have a login and play about. Um, we'll do a quick little whiz round. So you can see there you've got plenty of wizards to give you a hand. Um, so if we were setting this um, VPC up with a wizard, we could, but we will do it the manual way. If you want to see the topology, we can have a quick look at the setup we've got here. So you can see a, a couple of spine switches, a couple of leafs, and our APIC down the bottom. Okay. So as mentioned, the first thing we want to do is go and set up our VLAN pool for our tenant. And again, this will match the pool we created previously on uh, UCS. So again, we'll give it a, a, a reasonable name. So we'll call it a tenant one. And we'll call it a VMM for our virtual machine manager, which in essence represents our vCenter. VLAN pool. Okay, and we'll give it the VLANs, which, if I remember, was 2160, 2169. Okay, and we'll just confirm that we have our pool created. Okay, so we pop up to our global policies and create our AEP. Okay, we'll give it a sensible name. So tenant one VMM AEP. Okay, that domain profile is where we'll add in uh, the representation of our vCenter and our vSphere environment uh, a little later. Okay, so we have our AEP. Okay. All right, so next we need to create our interface policies. So as mentioned, we need to create a CDP enable policy to talk down to the vSwitch. And then a CDP disable policy um, between the Fabric Interconnect and the Leaf Switch. Because they'll be using LLTP. So again, we'll create an LLDP uh, enable and disable policy. Okay. LLDP disable. And then the LACP policies. So again, we'll create an LL an LACP enable policy for the VPC between the fabric interconnects and the leaf switches. And we want that active. And then a Mac pinning LACP profile. So basically, the distributed V switch uh, will just um, map uh, different VMs to different uplinks rather than try and load balance VMs over um, uplinks, which would cause uh, flapping between our fabric interconnects. Okay, so there are our policies. Okay. All looks good. 
So just to make that a little clearer, you can see in this diagram exactly where we will be using those policies. So you can see between the leaf switch and the uh, fabric interconnects, we'll have a CDP disabled, LLDP enabled, LACP active, because that will be the VPC. And we've got two VPCs, one for each fabric interconnect. And then below the fabric interconnects, we will then be using the CDP enable option, the LLDP disable option, and the LACP MAC pinning. Now, because that is a different uh, connectivity requirement to the, the main one specified in the AEP, we will actually be specifying a override policy, um, which APIC refers to as a vSwitch policy, which we'll see in the uh, next configuration. So this is the next configuration we'll be doing. Um, so first off, we're going to create the VPC policy group, uh, which represents each VPC and its configuration requirements. Uh, then we'll set up the uh, vSwitch policy or override policy. And as we mentioned earlier, that's basically to negate or override the VPC requirements uh, between the FI and the uh, leaf switches and override them with a more suitable policy for our vSwitch, um, the distributed virtual switch within the hypervisor. Uh, next thing we do, we're going to define the actual interfaces of our leaf switches that connects to our fabric interconnects. Um, and as you can see, just popping back to our uh, topology diagram there, that our port 11s are going to fabric interconnect A and our port 12s going to fabric interconnect B. Uh, now, as you'll see when we get into defining the policies, um, within the APIC, every policy in essence is just an object. Um, and objects and policies within the APIC are either being consumed or consuming. So they're either providing uh, a resource to something else or they're consuming a resource from something else. So um, as hopefully will be clear in the configuration section, um, there's a lot to be said to very sensibly designing your network. For example, our port 11s are both going to Fabric Interconnect A. So in essence, I can just use that single um, switch definition, um, apply it to that VPC, apply it to both leaf switches, um, and that will be our VPC defined. Um, the, the next thing we're going to do is create a switch policy, um, which will basically define the switches, the leaf switches that we're talking about. Um, in this case, leaf switch 101 and 102, uh, which switches will be uh, participating in the VPC uh, domain, essentially. Uh, and then the last thing we'll do, we'll just confirm that our VPC comes up on the UCS side and on the um, ACI side. Okay, let's jump in and create our policy groups. So we'll want two policy groups because we can't have all of these ports in the same VPC because they're um, downlinking to fabric interconnects, which, as, as we mentioned earlier, are not aware of each other. Um, so we'll need two VPCs, one going from our leaf switches to FIA and one going from our leaf switches to FIB. Okay, so again, give them rather sensible names. Uh, it's always good to suffix them with the, the entity that you're creating, i.e. PG for port group in this case. And then we'll reference the policies we created earlier. So you want to disable CDP, enable LLDP, and we want LACP active. That should match the settings that um, are defined on the UCS side. And then we'll reference it to our um, attached entity profile there. We'll do the same for the other VPC. So to FIB. And the same uh, set of settings, CDP disable, LLD, LLDP enable, and LACP active. Okay, and there's our two policy groups. So 
So now we'll create our vSwitch policy or the override policy. As mentioned earlier, the we can't do a active active lack p port channel from the V switch because they're using different fabrics. So we'll just override that. Um, and as we mentioned, the VIC cards do not pass through the LLTP LLTP, so we need to change that to CDP. And we want to use the LACP MAC pinning, uh, which will basically say um, for any MAC address. Um, it'll only pin that MAC address to um, one fabric, so we won't see a, a VM's NIC flipping between fabric A and fabric B. Okay, so now we need to actually create our interface profiles. So these are actually the interfaces on the leaf switches that will participate in the port channel. So as mentioned earlier, we're actually using uh, ports um, 11 to go to fabric A and ports 12 to go to fabric B. So this will be our fabric interconnect A side. So that'll be port 11 off both leaf switches 101 and leaf switches 102. And again, we'll call that something sensible like interface selector. And always good to put a description in there and it sort of helps your colleagues and helps yourself when you forgot that you've done this in a, a couple of weeks time and again it'll actually tell you the actual format it's expecting these interfaces to be uh, listed in so we'll give it a name tenant one FIA port 11 And that is one slash eleven. And because it's one slash eleven on both leaf switches, uh, we only need to define it once. And apply that to our interface policy group. So basically, you will know that one eleven should use LACP active, have CDP disabled um, and LLDP enabled. Okay, so there's our interface selector for FIA. We just need to do the same now for FIB. This may seem a lot of effort that we're creating objects right, left and center, but once they're created, you can then reference those objects um, in other policies. So the majority of the work is generally setting um, you, you know, uh, uh, anything up for the first time. So that once you've created one VPC, you can then just reuse a lot of the policies and the objects that you've created. So the interface selector to FIB. Again, give that a sensible name. So this whole model of um, sort of consumers and providers is a sort of very sort of uh, programming um, based. So it's quite a you know, developers type um, methodology. So, but that's the way we're all working towards these days. So it makes sense. Okay, and now our one twelves are going to FIB. And again, just this. Okay, so there's our 111s going to FIA and our 112s going to FIB. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is create our switch profile, which is saying which leaf switches do I want to apply that interface policy to? So in this case, it's going to be leaf switch 101 and 102. Okay, so I'll just create one of those. So 
uh, in effect is our, our VPC domain um, is what we're defining here, which switches will be participating. And then in this drop down box, we'll just define our leaf switches 101, 102, by which object this policy will be applied to. Okay. And then we'll pick our interface policy which we're going to apply to this so FIA in this case and then we'll do the same for FIB So again, so we'll just select leaf switch is 101, 102. Okay, actually thinking about it, I could have probably just reused my last uh, switch profile to be honest, because it's the same switch one and two. Um, but anyway, so that would have been a, a, a small efficiency, but not to worry. Okay. So there's our two switch profiles, so that should now be applied to our leaf switches. So they now should be sending LACP packets and be running uh, LLDP. And that link should, drum roll please, See, it never, never comes up when you're watching it, does it? Let's just check the other one. Okay, so the other one's up. And, oh, and there we go, it's up. Okay, so our VPC is now up between the fabric interconnect and the leaf switches. And we can do some verification on the ACI side. So again, if we Go and have a look at our physical interfaces within the um, fabric. So you can see we have a VPC domain. So if we drill down, so we can see our leaf switch is 101 and 102 in the local uh, VPC domain 10 there. And again, if we drill down, we'll see our interface policies. Okay. Okay, so if we actually want to have a go and physically look at these interfaces now. Go into our inventory tab, our pod one. And there are leaf nodes, 101 and 102, and interfaces. And we can see their VPC interfaces, and our domain 10 there, which is up, success. And you can see it's uh, currently the primary on 101 side. You'll also notice that um, there's no peer link or keep alive link or anything like that to, to worry about in a ACI environment. So again, lots of 
additional efficiencies. So you can see our two interfaces there for our two particular VPC links from this leaf switch. So our port channel 8 in has got Ethernet 111 in it and our port channel 9 uh, has got 112 in it, going to FIB. I don't think you can actually define these numbers. I think they're sort of picked out, um, I won't say randomly, but they are. I don't think you can uh, define them. Okay, so again, you can drill down a little bit more on various information. See that LACP is active. And it is trunking. So all the things you would expect to see from a, a switch port. And again on the UCI on the UCS side we can see that our port channels are up and happy, running at 20 gigabits. So there we go, the VPCs are all up and running. Okay, so the next part of the configuration is creating our tenants, uh, bridge domains and network creation. Um, so again, a bit of terminology here. So first of all, we're going to create our tenant. Um, think of a tenant as a uh, logical container, um, mainly for RBAC policy, uh, role-based access control. Um, so you would allocate um, you know, an administrator to a particular tenant and resources to a particular tenant. Um, and that tenant could not see anything else uh, from another tenant. So tenant A could not um, see any policies uh, or resources to do with tenant B, for example. Uh, next thing we're going to do is create our private network within that tenant. Uh, you can think of the private network as a virtual routing and forwarding instance or VRF. Uh, that essentially allows um, overlapping IP addresses within tenants because they're isolated. And then next we're going to create two bridge domains and the bridge domain is uh, basically a flooding boundary uh, which is roughly analogous to a VLAN. And then the last thing we'll do, we'll allocate um, the networks to the two bridge domains that we created. Um, and you can think of those like the switched virtual interfaces um, if you were creating these on a layer 3 switch. So let's begin by um, creating our tenant. So go up to the tenants tab. And we'll have a look at the tenants that are there um, already. You can see we've just got the default ones. Uh, by default, everything goes in the uh, common tenant. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is these health scores. Um, obviously, as, as, as issues um, progress, those health scores uh, reduce down. And you can drill down to see uh, what the issue is with that um, tenant. OK, so let's create our tenant. And again, um, let's make things nice and easy with our naming conventions and call it tenant1. OK, so we will not create our network right now. We're going to do that in a manual task in a second. So I'll just finish there. Okay, so now we are within our tenant. You can see that our tenant uh, one is highlighted on the um, ribbon there. Um, always worth checking you're in the right tenants before you start uh, configuration. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is create our private network. Okay, and again we'll give it a sensible name. T1 private. Okay, and by default we'll try and create a bridge domain, but we're going to do that manually just so you can see the process. So we'll untick that box. Okay, so there is our private network represented in that little uh, box there. So 
and now we'll create the first of our two bridge domains. So again, these are roughly analogous to a, a VLAN. They just describe the, the flood, flooding behavior of a uh, segment. So basically, they're, they're a layer two construct. Okay, so again, T1, BD1. And allocate that to our private network we just created. Okay. So something that you can see that our bridge domain is now there. And now we'll create our second bridge domain. Call this uh, BD two. Oh, just notice I've called this T two. Never mind, it's, it's only a name. Okay. Okay, so there are two bridge domains. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is we'll create the subnet for those bridge domains, which is in effect the layer three identity. Uh, you can think of these as the uh, switch virtual interface on a, a VLAN, on a layer three switch, if you like. So we'll give our first subnet 10.10.60 with the gateway of dot one. And it's that gateway address that it's actually gonna be uh, representing within the fabric. Okay, and we'll do the same for bridge domain two. So we'll give this a different layer three subnet range. And we'll give this 20.20.60. .20 Again, this is the gateway we're defining here, so dot one, and it will fill our mask in automatically. We'll assume a, a class four mask, but again, you can change that there. Okay. And submit. So there are our two uh, bridge domains with the layer three addressing associated. So we've, we are done with regard to the tenant creation, the private network creation, and the bridge domain creation. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is the creation of the application network profiles or ANPs and the endpoint groups or EPGs. So an application networking profile is a logical representation of an end-to-end -end application. Uh, that, that could be made up of uh, several um, virtual machines or several endpoint groups um, and the contracts between those endpoint groups, which basically uh, determines how they that application can communicate with the various tiers end to end. Um, so you can roughly think of the ANP as the service profile in UCS, whereas UCS is the service profile is an abstraction and a logical representation of an entire server. So the ANP is a logical representation of an application. But again, it will, think, you know, things should be made a bit clearer when we get into the, the config stage. With regard to an endpoint group, uh, an endpoint group, again, is a logical co uh, collection of endpoints which require a, a similar uh, communications policy. Uh, an endpoint, uh, for example, could be a, a server's physical NIC or a VMware's uh, a VM's vNIC, uh, an IP address, a domain name, um, or a, a VMware attribute, for example, um, and those endpoints are placed in EPG. Uh, the thing to bear in mind is that anything within the same EPG can communicate. There's no granularity of uh, micro-segmentation within an EPG. 
OK, so let's create our application profiles. So from within our tenant, we'll select application profiles and right click. And we'll have create application profile. So I'll call this again something sensible. So tenant one, my app. Uh, obviously, that could be you know, web, you know, application, database, exchange, uh, whatever application uh, you're creating. OK. So if we expand out that uh, application now, that T1 My App. And we'll create an application EPG. So we'll create two EPGs, one for our Windows hosts and one for our uh, Ubuntu Linux hosts. So we'll create, uh, call this again T1 Win7 EPG. And we'll map that to the bridge domain, the bridge domain one we created earlier. So in essence, we're manually associating this bridge domain in that endpoint group and we'll do the same for our Linux hosts we'll create another application EPG and we'll call this one uh, T1 Ubuntu EPG And we'll map this to bridge domain 2 that we created earlier, which I incorrectly called T2 bridge domain 2, but it should be T1. But again, just a name. But Right, OK, so those EPGs are now created. So if we go and have a look at the um, application profile and the representation of our application, you can see now we have those two endpoint groups all ready uh, to use. Okay, right, so in the next section, we'll be doing the uh, vCenter integration with uh, the ACI environment. Uh, so first off, we'll be creating our virtual machine manager. The VMM actually represents an external hypervisor, whether that's uh, VMware, Hyper-V, KVM, uh, whatever. So in this case, it is uh, vSphere in our case. So we'll create the vCenter domain and we'll uh, attach the VLAN pool and the um, AEP we created um, at the start of the exercise when we was defining the, um, uh, the UCS environment. Um, we created an AEP there, if you remember, the associated attachable um, entity profile, uh, which basically represents a external entity to the fabric. Um, and as the vCenter is part of that um, UCS environment, uh, vCenter is also um, associated to that same AEP. Again, it should be a, a lot clearer once we get into the, the configuration. And then we'll confirm our uh, VMM integration with vCenter. And then finally, in this section, we'll add the VMM to our EPGs we created uh, earlier. Um, so in effect, that will represent those EPGs within vCenter as VMware port groups to allow us to um, add virtual machines to these EPGs. OK, so let's start by creating our VMM. So we're going to VM uh, networking. And we want our provider as VMware. I'll fire up the vCenter in the background just so we can see uh, what's going on um, and the relationship between creating things on the uh, ACI fabric and how they affect vCenter. OK, so we want to create our vCenter domain. And we'll give it a name. T1-vCenter. 
Now we have the choice of the uh, VMware distributed switch or Cisco uh, application virtual switch. Uh, you can think of the AVS almost like the 1000V with the APIC doing the job of the VSM. Okay, and we will apply it to our AEP and our VLAN pool we created earlier. And now we need to add in the vCenter credentials. So we'll create a vCenter credential policy. We'll call it T1 admin. And our username and password. Okay. Let's look that there. And then we'll add our vCenter controller. Um, everything's a controller these days, but this is just our vCenter server IP address. Okay. In fact, I don't want the IP address in there. I want the name in there. That's where I want the IP address. Just type in there T1 vCenter. Now, data center, you have to type that in. Uh, make sure we get the spelling right. This is the vCent, this is the data center where we want our uh, distributed switch to be uh, created, which credentials we want to use. So now, that all looks okay. So we'll submit that. And that should have created our T1 vCenter distributed virtual switch within vCenter. And there it is. Okay. So next thing we want to do now is go and add in our EPGs to that VMM. So we go back into tenants and go and find our application networking profile. That's it, uh, T1 My App, and expand out our application EPGs and select our Windows EPG. And if we expand that out, we should have our VMM domains. So we'll right click that and we want to add a VMM domain association. Okay, so that's our VMM profile we've already created and we'll select immediate there. That's when the policy is actually pushed to the leaf nodes. Um, I think on immediate is when the hypervisor's physical uplink is connected and on demand is when there's actually a VMware's VNIC correct, uh, connected to the port group and the um, uh, resolution that's when the policy is programmed into hardware. Um, okay. And we'll do the same for the uh, Linux, the Ubuntu EPG. So exactly the same. So add VMM domain association and our domain profile and immediate, immediate. And submit. And as soon as we do this, some port groups should be appearing in vCenter. So we'll go over and check. Uh, 
and there they are one win 7 EPG and an Ubuntu EPG okay but that wasn't much fun because we didn't really see it uh, as to when it was pushed um, so what we'll do is I'll get them side by side and we'll actually do one again so we'll delete it out and recreate it and then we should just see it pop off and pop back into vCenter okay so if I just pick the Ubuntu EPG and delete that out yep and it's gone and let's pop it back in again so as soon as we're making this VMM association that EPG along with its VLAN is being pushed uh, straight into vCenter as a port group so we are now ready to add VMs into that port group okay so now we're on the home straight um, so in this last section we're going to look at the uh, port groups which are representative in of a EPG uh, in vCenter and contracts a contract in the um, ACI fabric is basically a rule between two APGs as to the communication they're allowed. Um, so in this section we're going to attach the ESXi servers to the uh, distributed virtual switch that the APIC has created and that's just the same process as um, adding a v, uh, ESX server into any DVS. Uh, we'll just choose the uh, two uplinks um, from our UCS server for our distributed switch. Um, then we're going to just confirm that the uh, uh, VMM integration uh, can be seen on the APIC. And then we're going to do a ping between two endpoints in the same EPG. So between two of our Windows boxes and two of our Linux boxes. As mentioned before, um, you can't actually restrict the communication within an endpoint group, um, only between endpoint groups. So again, it's just quite important that you bear that in mind when you're designing your endpoint groups. OK, then we're going to look at contracts. So we're going to create an ICMP uh, contract to ping between um, hosts within different EPGs and then we're going to create an SSH contract uh, to allow SSH between uh, host uh, VMs within different EPGs and then we'll just check the fabric interfaces along the way uh, just to see um, what they're learning so to give a diagrammatical um, picture of what we're going to do so you can see all the constructs that we've built up during the previous labs we've got our um, top level which is our tenant within the tenant we've got our private network um, and within that we have our two bridge domains that we created uh, BD1 and BD2 um, and within each of those we have our subnet uh, and within the subnet we have our gateway defined which means it is a, a unicast routable um, subnet uh, within our subnets we have then our um, EPGs uh, which we've um, allocated in uh, the two VMs uh, via the port group um, represented in vSphere so the point of this exercise is that we'll um, initially do a ping between two VMs within the same EPG just to prove that they have um, unrestricted uh, communication with each other um, and that a, a VM within a, an EPG cannot uh, talk to a VM in a different EPG without a contract. We will then create that contract and then do a couple of types of traffic through that contract. Um, basically a permit ICMP to allow ping and then a permit SSH uh, just to allow a, uh, a remote um, session onto the uh, Linux box from the Windows box right so let's get on that on the configuration front so on the APIC we can just go and see our um, two EPGs that we created so Win7 and Ubuntu and they are as we know are represented in vCenter as two port groups of the same name okay 
So the only thing I had to quickly uh, cut was about two minutes of video because uh, it went a bit funny. Uh, but the only thing uh, you missed there was me actually adding the two hosts into the um, APIC uh, DVS. But that's exactly the same procedure as you know just adding a host to any DVS. So you ha haven't missed much there. So we're now going to create or move our VMs into the um, EPG port groups. So our Ubuntu hosts and our VMs will be in our Ubuntu port group. Okay, uh, Ubuntu. And our Windows ones uh, into our Windows EPG. For some reason they are in the Ubuntu at the moment. We'll just take them out and put them in the right one, Windows. And the other one. Yep, you're in there wrong fella as well. So we'll stick you in Windows. Okay. Let's just have a little confirm. So yeah, so the Ubuntu EPG, we've got our two Ubuntu boxes and our Windows EPG, our two Windows boxes. So all standard VMware stuff there really. So if we have a look on the APIC side and have a look at those two EPGs and our operational tab, see what it's learned. So Windows are nice chatty boxes, so they shout shout every you know, from the rooftop, so it's found them. And the Ubuntu EPG. So Linux boxes are, are, are generally quite quiet compared to Windows boxes, so it can either take a little bit of time for them to, to learn them passively, or as soon as they start sending some traffic, it'll learn them. Um, you're, you're seeing the two Windows boxes there because they were in the wrong EPG before. Uh, and it just hasn't timed those out yet. You can see there that the VLAN associated is 2167. Um, in some respects, we, now in the um, ACI world, we don't actually care what the VLAN IDs are. Um, it just, you know, in effect, um, fires them out and assigns them via that pool we created. Um, you know, in this world of sort of uh, STN and application-centric infrastructure. You know, there's a, there's a a lot of bits that we're used to caring about traditionally as networkers, which we're going to um, care a lot less about. Um, VLAN IDs being one of them. Okay. So yeah, so it still hasn't timed out those two Windows boxes, but we're learning our Ubuntu boxes. So we found one at 20.20.60.21. So it gives us our IP address, the vCenter they're in. Um, and the interface they're in. Give that a little refresh, see if it forgets those Windows boxes. I'm not sure what the, the timeout is, but I'm sure it's We'll forget them as soon as it hasn't heard from them for a short while. Okay, we'll have a okay, so let's fire up a console box to each of these hosts. So we've got our two Windows boxes, which are, I think, 10.10.60.11 and 10.10.60.12. So we'll just make sure they can ping each other, which they should be able to, because they're in the same uh, EPG. So we can ping our default gateway of dot one. And if you remember, that's actually defined within the ACI fabric as part of our subnet configuration. So in effect, that's our SVI for that. Um, subnet out on the ACI fabric. So 
So we can ping our gateway and we can ping our uh, other VM in the same EPG. Um, as mentioned, that you can't actually restrict traffic within the same EPG. But again, that's the factor of when you're actually designing your EPGs, that you'd make sure everything within the same EPG, you're happy them talking talking between. So traditionally that would be you know a, a tier, you know, a web tier or something like that. Okay, and we'll just prove we cannot talk across EPGs currently. So let's try and ping our one of our Ubuntu hosts. So again by default there is a uh, implicit deny between EPGs. So, yeah, so both of those Windows boxes cannot talk to the Ubuntu EPGs, which have the uh, subnet um, associated of 20.20.60. .20 .60. Okay, so we're jump back on the APIC, see if that's okay so let's do the same on the Ubuntu side so our two Ubuntu hosts are 20.20.60.21 20 and 20.20.60.22 Again with the dot one gateway again out on the ACI fabric. That's good. We can talk to our gateways. I think this should be dot twenty two. Indeed it is. So I'll make sure he can ping dot twenty one. I'll make sure our other VM can ping the other way. Okay, so again, just proving we can uh, talk within our EPG. I will just confirm we cannot talk to the 10.10 .10 Windows boxes outside of our EPG. Which we cannot. And in order to do so, we will need a contract between EPGs. And contracts will be the next thing we will configure. OK, so let's pop back to the APIC. And you can see our two EPGs there. So I want to go into security profiles. And we first need to set up a filter. So think of a, a contract almost like a, a access control list, an ACL, and filters uh, the entries within that ACL. Um, so we want to create our filter and again call it something sensible. So we'll call this T1. We'll allow ping and we want to add that in so our ICMP IP and ICMP. There we go. And we click update on that. And submit. That should have created our filter. Create our contract. So 
So again, once you've created these contracts and filters, you are, are free to use them um, in multiple places. So again, of course, T1, allow ping. Okay, and the scope for that will be our tenant. So it can be used globally within the tenant. Okay, and we'll create a subject. A subject is like a, a, a logical subgroup of filters or a sub application if you wanted to group um, the filters into a subgroup. Again, we'll just call this T1 allow ICMP. And we've got the box there ticked already for allow uh, bi-directionally. And we'll choose our filter that we created uh, previously. And update. Oh, uh, update and OK. And submit, and that is our contract created. Oh, got a bit of a, a VPN lag here we go. when you're ready. There we go. Okay, so now we need to associate that contract with our EPGs. So, okay. So our Ubuntu EPG will right click or expand that out and go contracts and we'll add a provided contract. Um, with between EPGs, you normally have a provider and a consumer. Um, i.e. the EPG is either providing a service or an EPG is consuming a service. So for example, a, a web server would be providing you know, HTTP or HTTPS and a uh, consumer would be subscribing to that service. Okay, so we've just added that to our Ubuntu. But so this ping should still not work between EPGs because we've only applied it to the one EPG. We just confirm that we're still not working, which we're not. Okay, so that ping is just sitting there waiting to spring to life, hopefully with the the next assignment. So we'll just leave this one going. So again, our Ubuntu host is in the 20.20 .20 network, pinging our Windows host in our 10.10 .10 network. That certainly should not work at the moment. Okay, until of course we now go to our Windows EPG. Again, expand that out and contracts. And again, that allow ping contract and submit. That taboo uh, contract there was is in effect a an override uh, to the contract. So you can see our now ping has sprung to life. So we're now pinging between EPGs, and it's only the ICMP uh, protocol that is allowed. And just to confirm, we'll make sure we can ping back in the opposite direction, as we did uh, as bidirectional was, was, is the default option. So we'll just make sure we can ping back from our Windows box to our Ubuntu box.
which we can. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, add in a contract to allow SSH from our Windows box to our Ubuntu box. So we'll just confirm that SSH currently is not working, which it is not. So we we'll shall pop back onto the APIC and create another filter. So you want to create another filter, and again we'll call it something sensible. So we call this SSH filter. Just copy that in. Okay, and one IP and TCP. destination port to be 22. So we can either type 22 in there or, or select SSH from the drop down, but we know it's 22, so we'll just add that in. So again, it's asking for a range of ports there, so we'll just put from 22 to 22. And we'll update that. And submit, and that should add that filter in. Okay, so now we go and create our contract. So create contract. And give it a name. SSH again I'll scope that for the whole tenant and again our subject and allow SSH Call it what you want, allow remote SSH. And we'll select our filter and update and OK. submit so that's our contract created so now we just need to associate that contract with our EPGs so our win 7 EPG will be our um, consumer and our Ubuntu will be our provider so if you think of the provider as the server and the consumer as the client So our Ubuntu will be providing the TCP port 22 SSH service and our Windows box will be consuming it.
So we'll need a consumer contract. Okay. And now we'll go and test it. So I should just be able to do a, a putty restart on that failed session from previous. And boom, there we go, log in. So we just log in, make sure that's okay. And we are happy. Perfect. So that is our SSH contract, um, all working between EPGs. So you get the point. So again, you're more than welcome to specify as many contracts and subjects as your application demands. Um, and say once once they're created, they're all free to be reused. Um, anywhere in the environment. So we'll just have a quick recap. Uh, we've done a lot in the last sort of hour and 20. Um, so we'll just have a quick look at our interfaces from our Leafs back to our UCS. So we can just step through the inventory and we'll go and have a look, make sure everything is happy. So again, there's our two Leaf nodes, which are our VPC peers. We can drill down to those interfaces and our VPCs. So our VPC domain 10 and drill down and have a look at our interfaces. We can also get our stats. We can see the domain is up, the peer is up. The role in that case is primary. Successes are always good. And if we have a look at the other side, again the same VPC domain and the role is secondary. So again, if you're familiar with setting VPC up on the um, traditional Nexus platform, um, you should uh, you know, understand what all this is meaning. Um, and that, I mean, that's a, that's a case in point, really. Um, there's a lot of debate whether these SDN skills are going to uh, render us traditional networkers obsolete. But as you can see here, um, you really need to know what's going on under the covers. And if you've got a good fundamental understanding of uh, traditional networking, um, you should uh, know what a lot of this um, information means. Whereas obviously if you didn't have that grounding and didn't have that experience, uh, you wouldn't really know what you're setting up or how to set it up. So it's really just a case of the traditional networkers learning the GUI and learning a, a little bit of uh, new terminology. So thanks for sticking with me. If you're, if you're still with me, um, it's been a, a, a fair amount of information to take in. Um, but as I say, it's the great thing about videos that you can come back here as many times as you like um, and just sit back and uh, let it all wash over you. So again, thanks for your time uh, and feel free to comment and I'll speak to you soon.